Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cooking with Plants. Uh, I'm Kelly Wilson, and I'm one of the registered dietitians here in the Trinity Health Ann Arbor Lifestyle Medicine Program. Tonight, we're going to be talking about flavorful cooking, so how to make our the plant-based meals that we've been talking about in the last um, five classes taste really delicious. Um, and before I get into that, I just want to go through a couple housekeeping things. Um, so folks um, have requested information on captions. So you're looking at a screenshot of Teams right now that will show you how to do that. To add closed captioning, you go to the three dots at the top right that say more, select language and speech, and then um, a pop-out will say turn on live captions, select that, and you should see words populate on the screen. We um, have muted everybody and everybody's cameras are turned off, not because we don't want you to participate. We always want you to engage with us in our classes. Um, we do have the Q&A feature available for you to ask questions. So feel free um, to put your questions there. If you're on your phone or an iPad, you won't unfortunately have that function. So you can email us lifestyle medicine at trinity health.org if we don't answer your question throughout the class. Um, I ask if you are going to put a question in the chat, please make sure that it's relevant to what we're talking about in class and that it's something that everybody on the call would benefit from hearing. If the question is, is really involved or it's really specific to you, that email address I mentioned, Trinity, or excuse me, lifestyle medicine at trinity health.org is a great place to send those questions and we'll follow up with you from there. So I mentioned that um, I'm a registered dietitian with our lifestyle medicine practice here in Trinity Health Ann Arbor. I'm also a board certified lifestyle medicine practitioner. And for those of you who have not been with us before, I just want to share a little bit about what lifestyle medicine means. So we're all kind of on the same page. Lifestyle medicine is a medical subspecialty that focuses on disease treatment, prevention, and reversal, and whole person health through six key pillars. Those pillars are whole food plant-based nutrition, which we talk about here in this culinary class series, uh, daily movement, restorative sleep, social connection, managing stress, and then avoiding risky substances. I'm really excited that we get to have this class series as part of our lifestyle medicine program here at Trinity Health Ann Arbor because I believe that anybody can cook and I don't think cooking has to be scary. And I think a lot of folks, especially when they're thinking about whole food, plant-based foods, might feel a little intimidated in the kitchen or starting to move into the kitchen. And this class series is really designed to break it down and make it easy and help you feel empowered to step into your kitchen and put these plant foods on your plate. Um, you don't need fancy tools. You don't need really expensive ingredients. Everything that we're going to use in tonight's recipes and what we've used in previous class recipes are things you'll find at most grocery stores and you might already have in your pantry at home. Um, cooking is meant to be fun. It's a creative expression and food is more than just nourishment. It's joy too. And I hope that comes across in class tonight and you can um, taste that when you make some of these recipes. I, I also want to remind folks that recipes are suggestions, even the ones that I'm sharing with you. So if there's an ingredient that either you can't find, um, you don't have the taste for, um, you can swap in things that will work for you. OK, and we'll all try to talk about some substitutions as we go out throughout each of our recipes and then be patient with yourself if this is a, a newer process for you, if you're new to plant-based cooking, remember that change takes time and that's totally okay. And change is not a linear process. Um, it takes about 66 days to form a new habit. And so just keep trying, keep uh, pointing yourself in the right direction and be patient and persistent um, and you'll get there. Okay. Um, and then Start with what you know 
and adapt from there. Again, if this is a newer thing for you, um, you know, with our kids in our cooking classes, we do tacos because everybody loves tacos. And instead of putting meat in the center, we we do black beans and then we top it with shredded veggies. So start with something like that that's familiar and see how many of these new plant foods that you can add to your plate. All right, um, for those of you who haven't been with us, this is kind of an overview of our class series today. Like I said, we're talking about flavor. If you missed any of our previous classes, we do have a website where all of these videos are housed and you can go back and watch the recordings. I do want to note that um, we've got two new classes that are on the schedule from last month. In September, we're going to do a fermentation class. So we're going to learn all about um, gut health and fermented foods and how we can make easy fermented foods safely at home. And then in October, we're going to talk about fast, easy meals that are whole food plant based and snacks. Um, I always also like to include a little bit of a disclaimer in, in our class series uh, as a reminder that the information we're covering is general. So if you have a specific health condition um, that you're trying to manage, this may or may not apply to you, or you may need a more intensive approach than what we're, we're covering tonight. Especially if you've been newly diagnosed with a chronic condition, we definitely recommend that you seek some disease-specific education before making drastic changes to your diet. Now, with that being said, most people can benefit from adding plant-based whole foods like fruits and veggies and whole grains to your plate. Um, so don't be afraid by these recipes. Just make sure you're talking to your doctor and your registered dietitian before me making anything drastic. Um, if you need help finding a doctor or a dietitian, our website's here on the screen and you can email us and we'd be happy to make that connection for you. All right, so with that um, and those housekeeping things out of the way, let's talk a little bit about flavor. I want to start with a few notes about flavor to help kind of set the, the stage and give us some context for what we're about to talk about. Um, one thing I think it's really important to keep in mind is that the, the standard American diet or that you may have heard it called the SAD diet that we're surrounded by is really high in fat, sugar, and salt. And when we eat a lot of fat, sugar, and salt, this can dull our perceptions of certain tastes, and it actually can cause us to want more of the salt, fat, and sugar because we're kind of habituated to a, a higher level of intake. Now, that's not a totally devastating piece of news because what's really exciting is that our taste buds change every two weeks. So as we start to, you know, maybe ramp down our sodium or salt intake or ramp down our added sugar intake, our taste buds adapt and they become more sensitive to those flavors and those tastes. So we won't have to use as much sugar, we won't have to use as much salt in our meals. The other really exciting thing about the fact that our taste buds are always kind of changing and renewing is that we can learn to like flavors that we may not have previously enjoyed. Um, there's research that shows that about eight to nine times of trying something, repeated exposures can increase our likelihood to develop a positive um, association or a positive flavor experience with the food. And combining foods that maybe we don't have a taste yet for with things that are really familiar flavors to us that we really enjoy also helps increase. Um, so if there's a food that you know, you're like, I really want to incorporate beets into my life because of all their wonderful health benefits, but you haven't developed that flavor for them. Combine them with something that you know you really love, like carrots, and see if that can help you enjoy their flavor a little bit more. Combining foods that we um, might not enjoy the flavor of with enjoyable experiences. Our emotions really influence our perception of flavor and taste, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, but that's another strategy to help us enjoy or um, start to enjoy some maybe new to us foods. 
And then experiment with different preparation techniques. We'll also talk about that a little bit more, but different methods of cooking yield different flavor compounds in our foods. And so if you've had a food prepared, say by steaming, but you've never had that same food prepared by roasted, you might enjoy the flavor of, ro of a roasted Brussels sprout, say, more than you enjoy the flavor of a steamed Brussels sprout. It can be drastically different. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. All right, so what, what is flavor, this elusive thing that we've been talking about? It's really a combination of several different factors. So it's um, taste, mouthfeel, aroma, and then this kind of X factor, which is what our, our sense, other senses and emotions contribute. Um, so flavor, really, if you think about it, is a function of all of our senses. Flavor or taste, um, like I said, flavor is a combination of multiple factors and taste is one of those things. And this is, you know, what we're experiencing on our tongues and our mouths. Um, we have six different flavor families and food tastes really wonderful when it's balanced between all of these flavor families. Okay, so I just want to give you some examples of foods that are in each of these flavor families, which is always a tongue twister. So I got to say that slowly so I don't trip up um, so that you can start to think about how you might be um, experiencing these tastes in your food. And we're going to talk about balancing in a second. So then you can start to think about how we're balancing these foods. So bitter, um, a great example of bitterness would be um, coffee or black tea. Or if you've ever had um, a mixed salad and there's kind of red pieces in the, that salad that aren't cabbage, um, it might be something called radicchio. And that is a really bitter green that kind of grows in head-like form, like, like lettuce. You may have also seen that at the grocery store or farmer's market. Um, dandelion greens are also bitter. And some people experience things like um, leafy greens, like Swiss chard, or um, things in, in the brassica family, which is that kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, as being bitter. Um, and the reason why we experience bitter or why some of us even have a heightened perception to this bitter taste is evolutionary because when we were hunter gatherers and foraging around the bitter taste let us know that something had high levels of alkaloids and might be detrimental to our health or poisonous now we know all the foods that i just mentioned are not poisonous they're perfectly safe to eat and so now in our modern food system bitter does not necessarily equate to poison but some of us have a, a heightened perception of that taste because of that, that evolutionary history. Uh, another flavor family is sour. So this is what adds kind of sparkle and brightness to our food. So we get sour from um, citrus, vinegars, from fermented foods like um, pickled vegetables, uh, things like that, kombucha. Um, and then umami, this is our, our savory taste. It's kind of mouth filling, it's rich. It, comes from things like nutritional yeast, uh, mushrooms, especially like dried mushrooms, to tomatoes, specifically like dried tomatoes, sea vegetables like kombu. Um, and if you're tasting a dish and you're kind of like, oh, it's a little flat or bland and it needs a little bit more heft to it, it's often missing some umami. And so you can think about those ingredients I mentioned, and that might be what you want to add to try to like beef up that savoriness and that richness of your dish. Um, miso is another great option here in the umami category. And then salty, salt is a flavor enhancer. So it helps bring out these other flavor families. Uh, we're getting salt in our whole food, plant-forward cooking through like soy sauce or coconut aminos. Um, capers and olives are also really another great way to add some of that salt to a dish. And then salt, you know, just your standard table salt or sea salt. Now, sweet also is a flavor enhancer. And 
We get this in our food through things like honey, maple syrup. Um, mirin, which is a, a rice cooking wine, is on the sweeter side. Apple cider vinegar, while we're still getting some of that sour, also on the sweeter side. Fruits and root veggies would also be a way that we're adding sweetness to our dishes. And then last but not least, spicy or pungent, just kind of what it sounds like. So this would be things like chili peppers, where you're getting that like that heat and kind of that bite from a food. Um, ginger and wasabi would fall in this category too. If you've ever bitten into some fresh raw ginger, it's sweet, but then it's got that spicy kind of kick at the end. Uh, arugula, which is a type of, of green, some folks also experience this as spicy. And actually it gets spicier when it's exposed to heat. So summer arugula is on the spicier side compared to like a, a spring or a fall. All right, how do we balance out all these flavors when we're cooking? Um, I wanted you to know what the flavor families are so that you could start to think about the tastes that you're experiencing in the meals that you're making. Because I, what I would love for you to start doing as you're cooking is to taste. You know, it's totally fine to get a tasting spoon and, and dip it in the dish throughout the cooking process because that's the only way you're gonna learn how to season and how to balance the flavors. So as you're tasting your meals, if you notice, okay, there's a lot of bitterness that's coming through here, I need to do something about that, okay? Um, you can use your salty, umami, and sweet ingredients uh, to help balance out that bitterness, okay? Or if you have too much of the salty, umami, and sweet the bitterness can help you, you, like a bitter ingredients can help you balance those out. Um, and a great example of this would be raw cacao powder. So raw cocoa is really bitter. And when we have desserts with raw cocoa powder, we're usually adding a lot of um, sugar to kind of balance out that, that bitterness. Sour. Um, we use sour ingredients. So remember, these are like our, our, our citrus or vinegars more often than not to balance out bitter, to tamp down our perception of spicy and to kind of tamp down something that might be overly sweet. Great example of this would be um, those sauteed Swiss chard. We were talking about that as some people perceive that as kind of bitter, right? Um, you can saute that Swiss chard and then squeeze half a lemon on top. And that fresh lemon juice is going to drastically help decrease the perception of bitterness in those greens. For umami, umami helps balance out those bitter flavors, like I was mentioning earlier. And then it also enhances our perception of sweetness. So some examples of this at work would be broccoli. Some of us perceive, again, the brassica family, which broccoli is a part of, vegetables as being a little bit more bitter. So if that's you, you could take something like nutritional yeast, which is high in that umami flavor, and sprinkle it on your broccoli. And that umami sensation will help kind of balance out the perception of the bitterness in the broccoli. And then it also gives you kind of a nice cheesy like flavor, which um, is kind of delightful on the broccoli. Another great example here for using umami to enhance sweetness would be putting something like miso, which is um, a fermented soybean paste. And it's very salty. It's really like rich in flavor. It's often used to make a lot of broths. Um, but you can roast carrots, which are a root vegetable that have a high sugar content. So they're a naturally sweet ingredient with miso, that umami, and that sweetness that's in the carrots is really enhanced by the umami of the miso. Salty um, helps balance out sour and really enhances our perception of sweetness. So you can think about this um, if you've ever had a chocolate chip cookie that has some sprinkle of sea salt on it. That was probably one of the best chocolate chip cookies that you've had because that, that salt um, providing a little bit of textural difference and then that is enhancing your perception of sweetness from the sugar in the cookie and those the chocolate chips and then last but not least sweet so sweet is going to help us balance out 
um, sour flavors or bitterness or excessive spiciness. And then it's going to enhance our perception of salt and umami. So we can think of this at work with the example of caramelized onions. So when we caramelize onions, we're cooking them for a long time until they're kind of soft and nice and brown. And that caramelization process creates um, sugars. It helps release the natural sugars um, on, and creates a chemical reaction where the, more of these sugars are, are forming. And so those onions are, are sweet. We pair those with those Swiss chard greens that we were sauteing and Again, they're maybe a little bit bitter to some people. The sweetness of the caramelized onions is going to help balance out that bitterness. Um, another good example, if you're someone who enjoys curries or you want to start dabbling in making your own curries, a lot of the spices in curry, so like cumin or fenugreek or things like that, have a little bit of a bitter undertone to them. And so if we add a dash of maple syrup or honey to our curry, it can help tamp down that bitterness and really take our, our curry dish up a notch. So I'm going to pause there. It doesn't look like there's any questions. So we'll keep on rolling. So like I said, flavor is a function of all of our senses. It's not just what we're experiencing on our taste buds through those flavor families. So I want to talk about some of the other influencers, uh, mouthfeel, aroma, and that X factor that contribute to taste and flavor. First, mouthfeel. It is what it sounds like. Um, it's our experience in our mouth beyond the initial taste. So temperature is a great one. Um, coldness suppresses our perception of sweetness and heat increases our perception of spiciness. So if you've ever had um, a really spicy stew or really spicy curry, if it's very hot in temperature, it's gonna feel like spicier and hot in your mouth. But if it, you're eating it cold from the fridge, that heat is gonna be kind of tamped down. So consider this as you're um, playing with your, your flavors, think about how that dish is gonna be served because that temperature will impact the flavor. Texture, um, different textures of foods can hold sauces differently, which means we'll get more of that um, flavorful sauce in our each bite. So you can think about using texture as a vehicle for flavor. And texture also provides excitement. It keeps us kind of from getting bored. I think about this all the time when I like eat a Thanksgiving meal and there's lots of like soft, lumpy, mushy foods, which are delicious, but they're all really the same texture and that gets kind of boring for your palate after a while. So texture can help. Um, and then varying the shapes of your food can really change the flavor. And I think a really great example of this is a radish, like a daikon radish. If you shred a daikon radish and you eat a little bit of the shredded radish versus you cut off a large hunk and you take a bite out of it, it's gonna be a different flavor experience for you. One might be a little bit more spicy and one is gonna be a little more watery and sweet. And so I challenge you um, to try that at home and see what you notice about your perception of flavor from the shredded versus that chunk of the radish. And then finally, astringent. So this is kind of that mouth puckering, like if you've, if you've eaten an underripe banana um, or you've had walnuts, kind of their, their skins can kind of let into that astringency. Um, so when you have those kind of astringent foods, we, we want to balance them out with some more um, sweet foods as well. So think about that when you're adding them to dishes. Smell. Um, so this is a really important influencer on taste. About 80% of what we actually taste is smell or aroma. Um, and we use, this can clearly be seen in our use of aromatic ingredients, which are foods that have strong smells and can increase the flavor of dishes. Some examples are here on your screen, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of those in a moment. And then finally, there's this X factor, which is all the other things that influence our perception of taste, 
visual presentation, we do eat with our eyes. So varying your color and varying shapes and the arrangement on our plate, like this picture here, really can enhance our enjoyment of our meal. And when we're in a positive frame of mind and we think our food looks beautiful, we're more likely to experience a positive flavor from that meal. Um, and our emotions can influence how we're enjoying a meal. Um, so if you're feeling really stressed before you go to sit down for a meal, taking some time to practice some, some deep breathing, or maybe you need to like walk out of the room and then come back um, is really valuable because that cortisol that we produce when we have a stress response can actually dull our taste and can cause us to crave more like salty and sweet things. Okay. Um, and then I always like to make a note uh, also about uh, gratitude and bringing that into our meals because it, it is, I think, one of those ways that we can decrease our stress and be present with what is in front of us. And when we're more present with our meal and we're pausing to notice what's in front of us, we're more likely to actually taste and the whole suite of flavors that are in that meal. All right, before we get into the kitchen, I promise we're getting there soon. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple things about how we can add flavor to the meals that we're making every day. So the first way is through those aromatic vegetables I mentioned. And again, these are the veggies that have really strong smells that can increase the flavor of a dish. And there are things like garlic and onions and celery and peppers. Every cuisine around the world has a combination of different aromatic vegetables that are used as the base of a lot of cooking. In French cooking, it's called mirepoix, and it's um, our carrots, onions, and celery. Okay, so that's a really common one. And these aromatic vegetables you use at the start of cooking, usually you saute them in, in some oil because that helps bring out those aromatic, those um, really smelly and flavorful compounds. And that's the, that's the base flavor of your dish. The, um, cooking techniques can also influence the flavor of a dish. Like I mentioned, steaming versus roasting. When we roast, we're caramelizing the natural sugars. There's a process called the Mallard reaction that is happening, and we're getting this enzymatic browning, and the food that is roasted is going to have a sweeter flavor than if we steam it, and it's going to have a different texture. It might be crunchier than something that is steamed, and that texture, again, is going to influence um, that, that taste. Okay, um, we can add flavor through condiments. Just make sure um, that we're watching our, our sodium if that's something we need to be mindful of and still focus on whole food ingredients. Always read the label like we've talked about before. Um, things like kimchi and salsa and tomato sauce are really great options to use to add some quick, easy flavor to your meals. And then using stock or broth to cook beans and rice or any other grain is going to also allow you to add a layer of baseline flavor to the meal um, because you might use those beans or grains in another dish or you might be using them standalone. That broth is just going to add a really nice subtle hint of flavor. And then finally, spices and herbs, um, which we will talk more in depth on the next slide. So um, most people who are following a whole food plant forward way of eating don't and, and not eating a lot of processed foods don't necessarily have to worry about sodium intake, especially if we're eating a lot of fruits and veggies. Um, however, I think it is really helpful to know for those of us who do need to watch sodium, herbs and spices are a great way to add flavor without adding extra salt. They're also one of the, the highest concentrations of bioactives or these phytonutrients that we've talked about in our diet. So adding them not only has flavor benefits, but it has health benefits. We're getting a lot of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds from these spices and herbs, which is helping lower our internal inflammation. And as I think we've mentioned before, inflammation is the root of a lot of chronic illness. So anything we can do to tamp down our inflammation is going to be good. Um, and when we use spices in particular, heating them up in a little bit of oil or in a dry skillet 
actually helps increase their antioxidant capacity. So you may see a recipe calling for toasting your spices or blooming your spices. This actually is helping improve their health benefits for you. Um, when we're using herbs and spices, if you're using fresh, add it at the end, kind of as a garnish. If you're using dried, the general rule of thumb is at the beginning. Um, and a quick note that one teaspoon of dried herbs equals about one tablespoon of fresh. There. Awesome. Um, so if all of that was overwhelming, I want to give you something that's really quick and easy. Um, because again, the goal here is to really help you develop some more connections and awareness to flavor in your food. So if, if you're like, okay, I'm just getting started and I don't even know what those flavors are that you just mentioned. One thing that you can start with um, on the screen here there are some pre-made sauce mixes. Again, you still want to look at those labels watch for a lot of extra added sugar and they will be a little bit higher sodium. But what you can do is use these with your um, plant-based protein and some veggies and then start to get a sense of what flavors you like. So look at the ingredients list, see what you're, try to identify those flavors that you see on the ingredients list and start to find out and explore what flavors you naturally gravitate to and then try to replicate that in your own home kitchen. I think it can be a really good awareness building tool. Um, get curious about meals that you really like that your friends make. Ask them how they're seasoning and spicing what you're eating. Do the same thing at grocery stores. Um, and one of my favorite things I think is to stop and smell the spices. So if you have a spice cabinet, open it up, open the jars, give them a, a sniff. Remember um, that aroma is 80% of our taste. So smell, see what smells you like in combination. And often if you like the way two herbs or spices smell together, you're likely going to like the way that they taste together. And you can even do that like with your ingredients to get a sense of whether or not they might work in a dish. And then experiment, give yourself permission to make mistakes, to try different flavor combinations and fail. Um, that's the only way you're going to learn in the kitchen is to, as Miss Frizzle used to say on the Magic School Bus, to, to get messy and make mistakes. Okay, and it's perfectly fine. All right, with that, let's get into the kitchen and get cooking so we can talk through some of these recipes. So everyone should hopefully be able to see my cutting board here. Um, that's where the focus is going to be tonight. We're going to start with a really basic vinaigrette. Um, salad dressings are something we get a lot of questions about, and I think they're a really fast, easy way that we can add flavor to our meals, not just salads, but grain bowls. Um, we can marinate our tofu and our tempeh in these as well. So basic vinaigrette is usually a ratio of um, two parts or three parts of oil and here we go over here to one part of an acid. You can swap different oils and you can swap in different acids depending on the flavor profile that you're going for. We're doing a pretty um, standard vinaigrette so we're using a third cup of extra virgin olive oil just going into our bowl here um, we're using a quarter cup of lemon juice. You could use a balsamic vinegar, a white vinegar here if you wanted to. Um, we've got a quarter teaspoon of garlic as our seasoning. So usually your um, vinaigrettes are going to have, again, your oil, your acid, and then some seasonings and maybe some sweetener to balance it out. So we've got a teaspoon of maple syrup to balance out some of the acidity in the lemon juice. And we've got a probably about half a teaspoon of salt. And then we are going to zest, um, which is just taking this microplane tool and the rind of this lemon. So we are gonna zest about a teaspoon of rind into here. So when we're zesting, I'm just going until I can see the white. I don't wanna get too much of that white. I really just want the yellow. And what this is doing is it's adding another layer of the sweet kind of brightness. That's a little bit more to this vinaigrette. It kind of takes it up a notch from just the standard lemon juice. Okay, that's probably pretty good. Knock that off in here. 
And then we wanted a little bit of parsley in here as well. So I'm going to mince up some fresh parsley. When I'm working with parsley, um, the stems are totally fine. I just don't want too much stem, so I'm going to cut off these bottom pieces, set those aside. Um, and then when I'm using fresh herbs like this, I like to kind of roll them a little bit. And actually, I'm going to cut this in half and get it into a more manageable size and then kind of roll it. Um, I'm keeping the tip of my knife on the cutting board as I make thin slicing motions up and down. Okay. And then I'm going to just kind of gather this pile back together and go back over it. Again, the tip of my knife is on the cutting board, just going back over this pile until it's the size that I feel like won't get stuck in my teeth as much. <laughs> so you can mince this as long as you want to. You can also totally skip the, the herbs, the fresh herbs, but um, it does add a really nice layer to them. And this time of year with you know spring and everything starting to grow, we've got a lot of really nice fresh herbs available. So now I'm just going to whisk this all together to emulsify, which means mix together the fat and the acid. And there we go. We've got our really delicious vinegar, basic vinaigrette or um, marinade. So we salad dressing, marinade, grain bowl topping. Um, if you eat fish, nice like fish topping as well. Um, and if you wanted to change it up, you could maybe use a sesame oil and maybe you're using some orange juice and um, you're doing some ginger and some garlic and you're making more of an Asian flavored dressing. All right, our next recipe, we're also going to make another kind of um, dressing or dip option. This one's tahini based. And tahini, if you remember from previous classes, is um, sesame seed paste. So this is the tahini. It's ground up sesame seeds. So it's basically like um, peanuts are to peanut butter. Sesame seeds are, are to tahini. And tahini is really high in calcium. So sesame seeds are high in calcium. One tablespoon of this provides about 5% of our, our daily calcium needs. So it's a great way to get some plant-based calcium. This recipe is also oil free. So for those of us who are um, wanting to or needing to avoid added oils, this can be um, a nice dressing option. So we've got um, half a cup of tahini is going into our bowl here. And then we have got half a cup of lemon juice. Tahini is a little bit bitter. Um, and so that acid in the lemon juice is going to help us balance out some of that bitterness. And you can see as I whisk the tahini, it gets kind of a little clumpy looking and stringy and tahini, it's fat, right? And, um, this acid, this lemon juice is a lot of water. And so fat's hydrophobic, it doesn't like water. And as we're mixing this water into the, the fat, it's kind of resisting. And then as we continue to mix, you see how it, it comes together and it changes color. All of our fat um, particles have now been coated in that water. Okay, so just keep whisking until you see the it change into this um, kind of creamy and lighter color. We're gonna add um, a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder. Excuse me, I'm adding a half teaspoon, which is the equivalent of two cloves of garlic. Okay. And then I'm going to add, because um, our lemon juice is acidic, right, and the tahini is bitter, I'm adding a touch of sweetness to kind of balance out those. So this is a teaspoon of maple syrup. Okay. And then now this tahini dip is really thick. Okay, so it's it's more dip consistency, which you could totally dip um, some veggies in this, and that would be lovely. If you want it to be more of a horrible dressing that you're putting on top of your grain bowl or the roasted veggies that we're going to make in a minute, um, add a little bit of water until and then whisk it together until it's the consistency that you want. Okay, so I'm going to whisk this together a little bit more. Okay, this um, dressing or sauce makes for a really nice uh, mayo-free 
pasta salad dressing. If you're looking for something creamy for a pasta salad, this is often the base that we use as well for when we're making like a chickpea salad. So a, a mock tuna salad or, or a substitute for chicken salad. Um, we could use this dressing as, as the base to kind of pull that together as well. So this is kind of more the consistency that I want for drizzling on the roasted veggies we're going to make in a second. So I'm going to leave it here. But if you wanted it to be more pourable, just keep adding a little bit more water taste it and see if you need to add more salt, more maple syrup, a little bit more acidity with the lemon juice. Taste as you go. So I'm going to set that aside for a second. Lindsay, I'm going to hand you this. You could set it back there. That would be great. Thank you. All right. And then our, ne our next dressing is a green goddess dressing. This is also an oil free option um, and it's super tasty. And one of my favorite things to make this time of year when we've got a lot of fresh herbs like parsley and chives. So we're going to start. We've got half a cup of cashews. These are raw cashews that were soaked for 15 minutes in water that had boiled. And what this did is it softened them up. So it's going to allow us to mix these cashews together much more easily. Um, I have got a third cup of water. I'm just going to start with a little bit right now. I have got a couple tablespoons. This is two and a half tablespoons of lemon juice. Got a quarter, excuse me, a half teaspoon of garlic, which is two cloves of garlic. So you could use the fresh garlic here if you wanted to. I've got a teaspoon of coconut aminos, which is adding some of that umami flavor and also a little bit of salt. And I've got some salt. So I got a half teaspoon of salt. And then the green part is coming from, I've got some cilantro. So this is um, a quarter, excuse me, this is the parsley. This is a quarter cup of chopped parsley. And then I've got a quarter cup of packed cilantro. Um, cilantro, different than the parsley, I'm just trying to use the leaves and as little of the stem as possible because the stem is a little bit more on the bitter side. If you're someone who doesn't love part, um, cilantro and it tastes like soap to you, skip it here. And you can use something like a basil. Um, you could use um, some dill here as well if you wanted. And then I've got a small bunch of chives. These are just from my garden, so they're starting to flower a little bit. That's fine. I'm going to take the flower off because they can be a little bit bitter and take any kind of ends that look a little um dried and then I'm gonna break those in half and stick them actually you know what I'm gonna cut them a little bit more so they don't get wrapped around to the blades here. Okay we're gonna throw all of that into our blender here. Clean off my knife and then we're gonna zip this. So bear with me there's gonna be a little bit of noise. And actually, I'll try to mute myself so there's less noise. OK, so we're going to check and see. All right, this is why I need all that water, right? It's chunked up. Um, that's great. But now I need it to start mixing together. So I'm going to put the lid back on and we are going to mix away again now with a little bit more water. Okay. Let's check our consistency. And that's kind of more what I'm looking for. So it's thick, um, but you can thin it out with a little bit more water. You can thin it out with a little bit more um, lemon juice if you would like here. I personally kind of like this consistency because my favorite way to use this is tossed on like a very um, spring pasta salad where I'm tossing in some maybe lightly steamed asparagus, throwing in some chickpeas, some shredded carrot, maybe some olives. Um, if you want to thin it out a little bit because you uh, want to pour it onto a salad, 
Again, just add some water, add a little bit more lemon juice, taste it, and adjust some of the spices because the, the water will dilute that. Um, and then this will store in the fridge for, you know, three to five days. Okay. Uh, so there's your green goddess dressing. Also really great on a green bowl uh, if you keep it in that thicker. So I'm going to set aside these things. I'm going to move on. We have two more recipes to get through. Clear off my space a little bit. Our next recipe that we've got here, we're going to use um, this food processor. So hopefully, and well, yeah, I think that'll be good. Um, we're going to make a cheese sauce. So um, I don't know about you, but I really love mac and cheese and not eating cheese. Sad. I don't get to have that mac and cheese experience. But um, America's Test Kitchen, which is a place that I've learned a lot about cooking from and, and highly recommend them as a resource if you um, want some more information on cooking and, and kind of science based cooking. They have a really wonderful cheese sauce recipe in their plant based cooking cookbook that takes russet potatoes, which russet potatoes are they're the ones that kind of have the like the brown skin. Um, they're about the size of my hand. They're your standard kind of baked potato potato, and they're really high in starch. And that starch is going to help us make a almost kind of like nacho cheese consistency sauce here. Um, so I've got 12 ounces of roasted of um, excuse me, russet potato cut into one inch pieces. Um, a, again, a 12 ounce potato. I mean, who who knows what 12 ounces looks like in the potato? I didn't either. I went to the grocery store. I bought a potato. I weighed it. One standard kind of russet potato about the size of the palm of your hand is roughly 12 ounces. You don't have to be exactly perfect. Um, about 12 ounces with juice. So one large potato cut into one inch pieces. We've got um, a small carrot that was also cut into about one inch pieces, put into a pot of boiling water and boiled for um, about 10 minutes until they both were really soft. And you can just check, okay? So we're gonna take those, they were already boiled before class. We're gonna put them in this food processor. So go in here, okay. And I did a double batch, so I'm just going to do a little bit at a time. We've got um, two tablespoons of olive oil. We're using olive oil. This is a cool application. We're not heating this really high. Um, and then I've got, we're doing two and a half tablespoons, or excuse me, one and a half tablespoons of nutritional yeast, that umami kind of cheesy flavor. And then I've got an eighth of a table, excuse me, eighth of a teaspoon of mustard powder. So this is just ground mustard seeds. Um, there's many different brands of it at your grocery store. Um, this is the one that I could find at mine. It's not the one that you have to use, um, but one you could look for. And then we've got a, a teaspoon of salt. And we are going to, I've got some water here reserved too in case we need it. Um, so I'm going to get this lid attached properly. There we go. And we are going to give this a whirl. So I'm going to mute. OK, I just want to pause here and show you how it's it's not quite as smooth as I want it yet, but do you see how it's kind of starting to to lump together? And it almost has that like cheese ball. If you've ever had like the cheese, seen a cheese ball at party, it's kind of like that cheese ball consistency. And those are the starches in those potatoes doing their work. I want this to be a little bit smoother. I want less of those carrot chunks. So I'm gonna let this blend for a little bit longer. Touch of water to see if that's going to help. 
Okay, and then we're going to blend away. So one second. Okay, that's looking a little bit better, a um, little bit smoother consistency. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to pause here, but I would, if I had a little bit more time, to probably continue to blend this until all those carrots. And honestly, what might have happened, I may not have, have boiled my potatoes and my carrots long enough, so my carrots were still a little bit hard before they, they went into this blender. So really make sure that those carrots and potatoes are mushy. Um, before you put them into your, your blender. Now, where I could use this sauce, I've got this lovely pot of cooked um, garbanzo bean pasta, which is um, gonna be full of plant-based protein and some green peas for some additional fiber. And they're also really chock full of protein. One cup, nine grams of, excuse me, half cup, nine grams of protein. Um, we're going to add our cheese sauce. And like I said, um, I only used, I made a, a one batch and I wanted to double because I had a big pot of pasta. So this might not cover all of our pasta, but we're going to stick it in here. And um, bean-based pastas, when we're, when we're using them, they're, they tend to be a little bit more crumbly than others. So I like to try to undercook them. I did not follow my own advice before class, I got a little distracted when I was prepping some other things. So you you might notice as we fold in the cheese um, that some of the noodles break up and that's totally fine. What does help also with mixing this cheese into our uh, macaroni noodles here is if it's a little bit warmer. So I prepped the um, sweet, the potatoes and the carrots ahead of time. So they were cool by the time that we blended. But if you um, made them warm, then you would have a nice warm sauce that is being folded into your mac and cheese and it would spread a little bit better okay so there we go it's that's pretty well mixed um into our pasta there so there is our beautiful plant-based mac and cheese all ready to go and if you were here i would share it with you um but i think all the team here we're going to enjoy this after after class so maybe sometime in the future we can we can share some of this. Our very last recipe that we are going to do is for some roasted veggies. So I'm going to show you um, get a few things out of the way here. Thank you, ma'am. All right, we have got the sheet tray, and this is what we're going to be roasting our veggies on. I'm going to set that aside for a second so we can prepare our veggies. So this recipe, um, we're using a sweet potato, which is peeled already. And I just wanna show you how I cut it to get it to the size pieces I want. Um, I cut it in half, so it's a more manageable piece. Lengthways on the cutting board, cutting it ha in half again. And then I'm gonna use the cut side down on the cutting board so that there's some more stability. And I'm gonna cut evenly spaced slices. And then I'm going to stack those slices on top of each other, slice down the middle, and then evenly spaced cuts so that I'm getting diced pieces. So evenly sized kind of cubes. OK, those are going onto my tray. Do that. We're going to pretend that I have done this for an entire sweet potato. OK. And then our other ingredient we're adding are some Brussels sprouts. Now, I know Brussels sprouts are somewhat divisive. A lot of people have had bad experiences with overboiled, overcooked Brussels sprouts. Um, we're gonna roast them. So again, some of those natural sugars develop, they become a little bit crunchier to prepare them for roasting. We um, slice off the, where they connect to the stem of the Brussels sprout plant here. And that's gonna help re remove some of those outer leaves, okay? If there's any other outer leaves that look a little brown, we're gonna peel those off as well. And looks like this one has a few brown spots. So what we're gonna do is just kind of trim that, get rid of those brown spots. And then I'm gonna cut the Brussels sprouts in half, uh, maybe quarters to be similar sized to my pieces of 
sweet potato. And if you remember the brassica family, we've got a little bit of bitterness going on in these babies. So we've got some sweet potato that's gonna help balance that out for us. Okay, I'm gonna stop there just again for the sake of time. So you, but I think you hopefully have the idea of what we're doing with those sprouts. And then I've got a red onion. Okay, so the re full recipe calls for one whole red onion, um, one whole sweet potato and one pound of Brussels sprouts. Okay, to prepare this, we're gonna cut this differently than we've cut onions in other recipes because we want half moon shapes. So I'm gonna cut, I peeled it, I'm gonna cut the um, stem end off. And then using these same lines, these veins on the onion, I'm gonna use those as a guide. And I'm gonna take the tip of my chef knife and slice all the way through down to the cutting board, kind of evenly based. Okay. And then I'm going to cut the root end off and I have got some beautiful little half moons. Those are going onto my cutting board here as well. Okay, and I'm going to stop there so about we're proportional. And then I've got some avocado oil because we're going to roast these at 375 for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, I'm using avocado oil, which can withstand some higher heat. I've got some lemon juice here as well. So um, the full recipe calls for about a tablespoon of lemon juice. So I'm just going to sprinkle some on here. The full recipe also calls for um, a teaspoon of salt. I'm just going to sprinkle some salt on this small little pile that we've got here. And then the full recipe also calls for a tablespoon and a half of za'atar, which is a Middle Eastern spice blend that includes sesame seeds. Um, it includes sumac, typically thyme, oregano. Um, every spice blend is a little bit different. You can make za'atar at home too with those ingredients. Lots of recipes online for that. This is just a pre-made one from Kroger. I'm gonna sprinkle some of that on here. Again, the full recipe calls for a tablespoon and a half. Okay, and the, the sumac in the, the za'atar adds a level of brightness to the dish. It pairs really well with that lemon juice to kind of add some, some brightness and zing to the dish. The onions, when they cook, they get caramelized and they're adding some sweetness, again, alongside with those sweet potatoes that are going to help balance out that inherent bitterness in our Brussels sprouts. So we put this in the oven. 375 for about 25 minutes. If that's not long enough. We put it in for another five to 10 minutes and check. And then when it comes out, it looks like this. Okay, so we've got those caramelized onions. We've got these beautifully roasted sweet potatoes. Um, and we can now add a little bit more of that za'atar if we want. We can add a little splash of lemon juice if we need a little bit more of that brightness. And we've got a beautifully roasted veggie dish. We can also take that tahini dressing that we made. Um, this tahini is a really common Middle Eastern ingredient, and you'll find it a lot, honestly, with the spices that are in the za'atar. So it'll pair really well with our veggies here. And we can top this off with a little bit of that creamy dressing. And it's nice, too, because it, it creates a different um, texture to the dish. So we get the, the the crunchy from the roasted veggies, and then we've got kind of this creamy sauce that goes on top. So there we go. We've got our, our really beautiful roasted veggies with that yummy tahini that's adding another layer of flavor to our meal. All right, I'm gonna. Um, that's all for like the, the kitchen. Those are all of our recipes for tonight. They'll be on the website by the end of the week. Not all of them are there yet, and I apologize for that. But they'll be there by the end of the week. Um, and then I just wanted to share a couple quick announcements. So I'm going to pull up my um, PowerPoint again real quick. I wanted to let everybody know. So in addition to these monthly cooking classes, if you're interested in learning more about lifestyle medicine, we do have a Foundations of Lifestyle Medicine class series. We do culinary demonstrations in those classes, but you're also going to get the evidence-based recommendations and guidelines in each of the six pillar areas, as well as tips for how to apply that science 
into your everyday life. So it's a really great um, skill building opportunity. We have a class coming up starting June 3rd. Um, it's an evening class on Monday nights. If you're interested in that class, please email lifestylemedicine at trinityhealth.org and we can send you more details. Note, um, though, that we do bill insurance for this class. It's not a free class like this one. So you do want to verify your insurance coverage before signing up for the course. Um, again, email that lifestyle medicine email address and we can get you the appropriate information you need to provide to your insurance. Um, and then if any of you are Trinity Health colleagues, you do get live your whole life points for attending these classes or watching the recordings. You can get up to 250 points for each class that you attend. And a reminder that we need 5,000 points every quarter to keep our insurance premiums low. So um, if you want those points, email lifestylemedicine at trinity-health.org and I'll send you those points um, and you can then add them into your portal, your um, Virgin Pulse portal by going to the rewards area that you see circled here on the screen. Right, that is um, everything that I had for you all this evening. If there are any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or like I said, send us an email at Trinity Health at Lifestyle Medicine, or excuse me, <laughs> backwards, scratch that, reverse it lifestyle medicine at trinity-health.org um, and we'll be, be happy to answer those questions. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Um, this is always a pleasure. I love being able to teach these classes and I hope that you feel empowered to add flavor to your meals and I wish you a month of happy delicious meals. Take good care. <laughs>